In this video, I want to dig a little deeper into how capacitors work and what we can learn about electric fields and potentials from studying them. So the model that we've used for a capacitor so far is a parallel plate capacitor. And it turns out there are some other kinds, but this is the one that we're going to study for now. And a parallel plate capacitor, if you recall, consisted of two conducting plates that are arranged parallel to each other, hence the name. Like this. And we put some charge on each plate. So if I put a positive amount of charge on this plate, then it will spread out evenly. So I've drawn five charges. We want an equal and opposite amount of charge on the other plate. So I'll draw five negative charges. And um, between the plates, we found that the electric field is approximately constant. So if we treat the plates as being infinite in size, then the electric field is exactly constant between the plates. Um, but even if it's not actually infinite, then the electric field is pretty close to constant between. Furthermore, we determined the size of the electric field as being Q over A epsilon naught. So when we used Gauss's law to figure this out, the charge density showed up, Q over A, and epsilon naught is just the permittivity of free space, the usual relationship between um, or a usual expression for just that constant, the relationship between the charge and the electric field. Okay, so what I want to imagine doing now is suppose that I put a charge somewhere between these plates and then I let it move under the influence of the electric field down to some other point between the plates. Okay, so the electric field is, in this case, is going to push it in this direction and I'm going to call that distance that it travels d. It travels a distance d. And I want to think about how, the, how much work the electric field does on that charge, because then I'll be able to figure out something about the energy. Okay, so the expression for work, remember, is force times the distance that the object moves times cosine theta. And in this case, the um, theta is going to just be zero. So the electric field is pointing downwards, the object moves downwards, so um, the angle is zero, cosine of zero is one. So in this case, that's going to just end up being F times D. Okay, but I know a relationship between the force and the electric field, so F equals Q times E. So I'll go ahead and plug this in for my force. And I get that the work done is Q times E times D. All right. Now, when we defined potential energies in the first place, we had a relationship between the work and the potential energy. So the work is equal to the change in potential energy, um, well, the negative change in potential energy. Um, don't get too caught up on the minus sign because we're going to end up getting rid of this by the end, but um, it's part of the definition. All right, so I'm going to plug this in for the work, and then I get this relationship that negative delta U equals Q times E times D. Um, but we also had another relationship between the energy and some other quantities. So we defined the potential as having this relationship between energy and the electric potential. If I know the electric potential at some point and I place a charge there, then I can calculate how much potential energy that charge has. And from this, you can actually figure out that a change in potential energy is equal to Q times a change in potential. So I'm going to make this replacement in my expression over here. So I get negative Q delta V 
equals Q E D. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm going to now rearrange this expression. So if I solve for delta V, then I get delta V equals, well I have charges on both sides and those are going to cancel out. So delta V equals negative E times D. And now based on um, what we've done so far, the electric field here is just a magnitude and the distance is just a magnitude um, and I've ignored everything else in this expression. Um, so because these are just positive, but this one is um, positive or negative, this minus sign doesn't really make sense the way that I've derived this. So often what we do is we say delta V equals E times D and then figure out the sign afterwards. Okay, and this expression is true for um, any time we have a constant electric field. And we've seen that that shows up in a capacitor, but there are other times when an electric field is constant or approximately constant, and then we can use this expression. Um, it is not true in general. So this only works for constant electric field. Okay, but this is going to be a really useful expression to have. Okay, and the reason this is such a nice thing to have at this point is because this is our first relationship our first direct relationship between potential and electric field. If I move some distance in an electric field, I can figure out how much potential difference there is between those points. Um, and that's pretty useful. We didn't have any expressions like that before. Um, potential and electric field were these um, pretty separate ideas that we got through um, from a series of kind of circuitous calculations, but now we can see that they're actually really closely related to each other um, directly. <coughs> okay, but this isn't the end of the story. So I have a relationship between the potential difference in the electric field in a capacitor, but I have an expression for the electric field in a capacitor. So let me combine those quantities. So this is back to being in a capacitor The electric field is equal to Q over A epsilon naught. But I also have delta V equals E times D. Okay, so if I plug in my expression for the electric field, delta V is equal to Q over A epsilon naught times D. All right, and quite often we write this in a slightly different order. So the um, if I uh, rearrange this thing algebraically, then I get that the charge in a capacitor is going to be equal to some stuff. So the charge is going to be equal to epsilon naught times A over D times delta V. Okay, so this is going to be kind of the key relationship for working with capacitors. Um, so what is interesting about this? Well, one, we want to notice that the um, charge is proportional to delta V. Okay, so if I increase the amount of charge on a capacitor, then I increase the potential difference. If I increase the potential difference, then I increase the amount of charge. Those things are always going to be in proportion to each other. Also notice that the constant of proportionality, epsilon naught A over D, 
only depends on the capacitor. It doesn't depend on what I do to it. Um, and in particular, um, it only depends on the shape. So A was the surface area of the capacitor. And if I want the delta V between the plates of the capacitor, which ordinarily I do, then that's just D is the distance between the plates of the capacitor. So um, it doesn't even matter what the capacitor is made out of. It could be made out of copper or aluminum or anything. Um, and all that matters is the shape. I'll get exactly the same um, relationship between the charge and the potential of that capacitor if it has the same shape. Okay, so we give this constant of proportionality a name, epsilon naught A over D, um, we call C, which is the capacitance. And basically the capacitance tells us how good of a capacitor we have. So an object that has a really high capacitance, we would say is a really good capacitor, and an object with a small capacitance is a weak capacitor. Um, the units of capacitance, well, looking at the relationship that we can write down, if I write Q equals C delta V, well, the units of C are going to be charge divided by voltage or potential. So one coulomb per volt is defined to be one farad. named after Michael Faraday, um, a famous physicist. Um, and a farad, it turns out, is an enormous unit of capacitance. Um, in real capacitors, a normal amount would be, say, a nanofarad, or a billionth of a farad, or a picofarad, which is a trillionth of a farad. Those would be normal amounts to use in, say, an electric circuit. <coughs> So um, this is a useful relationship. If we take a capacitor and we apply some potential difference across it, then the amount of charge is determined. And if we put a certain amount of charge on a capacitor and we know its capacitance, we can figure out what the potential difference is between the two plates. <coughs>